Hello there everyone, it's UXW Bill with you here once again for another adventure into my vintage computers collection. And I'm coming to you from the nice cool comfort of the basement to discuss this computer, which on the surface is just another nameless clone. As you can see, looking at the outside of the case here, this system is a little dirty and a little grunty looking. This is not my doing. The previous owner of this computer had parked it out in their garage and there it sat for a number of years until I eventually came along, pointed out that it was still sitting there and that I was interested in it. So even though it's a little filthy inside and out, it should clean up. I think even this oxidation will come off with some careful work. Obviously I can't do much about these rust spots that are on the power supply. The power supply still works pretty well. It's a 200 watt. AT style power supply. Might even manage to produce that much power. And amongst the mess here, you can just make out the fact that there is a motherboard in here. And this is a 386 motherboard, which is part of what makes this thing so special. I've seen this board used in a number of computers over time. It doesn't seem to have been all that uncommon of a board. It's a biotech board, which I believe was once upon a, once upon a time the trading name for Biostar. And you can see that it came fairly late in the life of the 386 processor. If you look at the date code on the chipset there, the 9241, you can see that this system was almost certainly assembled sometime in 1993. And that was about a year after the first Pentium processors came out. Now on to what makes this thing so special. Right there it is, folks, the magic elixir that makes this computer something more than just a boring beige box. What you're looking at here is Advanced Micro Devices' first major foray out of simply cloning Intel's x86 processors. As you can see, this is a 386 class processor clocked at 40 megahertz. AMD produced those processors as a cost-effective alternative to the 486. But as it turned out, that processor was actually capable of outperforming some of the lower end 486 microprocessors that were on the market at the time. And this board actually opens the uh, floodgates a little further for performance because right here you can see that there is level 2 cache on this motherboard. And the level 2 cache can be used to store frequently used programs and data snippets so that the microprocessor does not have to incur the performance penalty of going back out to main memory. Here's the only bit of bad news, or maybe sinister news. Right there you can see a nickel cadmium battery. This is used to keep the CMOS memory intact and the system clock running. Ordinarily, when this board was brand new, that battery was recharged whenever the system was on. Many years have gone by since then. It's been almost 20 years ago that this system would have been put together. And as you can see, this battery is in the process of doing something bad. It's leaking nasty acid, and it's already started to corrode the motherboard. This is really bad news, and it's a ticking time bomb for any computer that has one of these onboard rechargeable batteries. The reason I mention this is to point it out to anyone who owns a similar vintage computer from late model 286 systems all the way up to early 486 systems and maybe a few low-end Pentium boards even had those nickel cadmium batteries in place. They leak and they're bad news because when they leak they eat the traces off the board. And here I have a motherboard out of a leading edge 386SX. This board looks great. The computer I found it in is great, was in great condition but the board doesn't work anymore. Why doesn't the board work anymore? The reason is simple. Look at those traces that have been eaten away by the corrosive action of the chemicals inside that leaky battery. There may be other reasons why this board doesn't work, but this is a big one because with those traces damaged, critical circuitry can no longer communicate and make this thing function properly as a computer. So it's probably already too late for this board, although if I were enough of a twiddle fingers, I could try scraping the green insulating solder mask off of those traces that have been damaged and jump her over the bad spots in an effort to try and get this board to run again. Since it's not too late for this other board, I'm going to do what needs to be done here. Basically, 
This battery needs to be removed. It needs to be gotten out of here before it really does end up trashing something. There are two ways to do this. There's the low-tech way, which is to simply wiggle it back and forth until the leads break of fatigue, at which point you should wash your hands and throw the battery away, or provide it to the proper trash collection authority for hazardous waste, if that's required in your part of the world. Or, if you're feeling fancy, you can whip out your desoldering equipment, remove the motherboard, and desolder the battery. However, that operation definitely carries with it some risk, because you could inadvertently hit the board with an electrostatic discharge. So it's up to you which method you want to use. Now you should be able to see firsthand just how this battery failed and how it managed to cause damage to the motherboard. You can see that on one end there has been significant leakage of corrosive material from inside this old nickel cadmium battery. So like I say, this is junk and it needs to be properly discarded. Now it should go without saying that when you do take the battery off the board, it's no longer going to keep its time and date settings current, nor is it going to maintain the contents of its CMOS memory. If this is a problem, many motherboards have a solution in the form of a 4-pin connector to which an outboard battery that is typically non-rechargeable can be attached. These batteries used to be very common and very readily available. I don't know where you get them in this day and age, or even if they're still on the market, but they may be. So you might check around online and see if you can find one of those batteries. You also need to make sure that the battery you select is of the correct voltage for your system. This system used a 3.6 volt battery. Some systems may use 2.4 or even as many as 6 volts with their clock batteries. So with that evil battery thwarted, on to some bigger and better things about the rest of the motherboard. One thing that's curious about this motherboard's design is the lack of any 32-bit expansion bus. Now in the day when this motherboard was made, there could have been PCI slots put on it, although I don't think there has ever been a 386 system for general purpose use produced with PCI slots. Maybe there's an embedded system of some kind that was made that way. It's a little bit surprising. I don't know if when this board was new, if a fancier version would have been available. But as you can see, all it has is fairly boring, plain old 8 and 16-bit ISA slots. Which again, are kind of surprising to find on a motherboard such as this that is a very high performance type. You'll also notice the SIM sockets, which are 30-pin only types. Again, this would have been pretty late in the life of 30-pin SIMs, which were most popular during the late 286 and early 386 era. Over here is a socket for a math coprocessor. These days, every modern computer you can buy comes with a math coprocessor integrated into the CPU. These days, it's simply cheap enough to do that, whether you need it or not. Back when this system was new, the math coprocessor was an expensive component, and so it was left out to be added later if you needed it. That changed with the advent of the 486DX. Now Intel never got around to producing either a 40 MHz 386 processor, and so they never got around to producing a 40, a 40 MHz 387 processor either. However, other companies such as Cyrix and UMC definitely stepped up to the plate to deliver what the users of a, 480, of a 386 system clocked at 40 MHz needed to install a three, uh, math coprocessor in their computer. It is rumored that there was a 50 MHz version of this AMD 386DX processor. However, I have never seen one. I've just heard a number of people say that, and when that many people agree on something, I tend to think that there might be something to that theory. Well, that's pretty much all there is that I can think of to say about the motherboard. So even though I haven't really done anything with the software on this system, let's go ahead and power it up here. I'll have to hook up a keyboard, but then it'll be ready to go. There is definitely an interesting notation on the side of the power supply case where it's been sealed with a quality assurance sticker to keep people from tampering with it. Look at that top passage, which is really meant to say burn in. It says burning. I don't think that a burning power supply is a good thing. And I think there's a lot of people who would share that opinion. This motherboard does not have a front-mounted keyboard port. That is a feature of the case. There is actually a redirection cable, a bundle of cables, that serves to redirect the keyboard port to the front of the case. And look here! You can see more damage done by that battery. I'm really kind of surprised the motherboard in this thing works. It did a couple months ago. Hopefully it still does. Let's go ahead and power up here and see what happens.
Well, it's still alive. Four megabytes of memory, CMOS checksum failure, CMOS display type mismatch. So we'll have to run the setup utility, which it should take us right into. Now it appears that it's misdetecting my monitor type, which is a common problem with these cheapo Trident video cards. We'll just go in here and make sure that things are relatively sane. Yep, it's going back to the 1980s. Full two years before I was even born. So let's see here. It is March. What is today? I think today is the 18th. And we'll see if it'll actually go up to 2011. You know, a lot of people made a whole bunch... 2012, I'm sorry. A lot of people made a whole bunch of noise about the year 2000 back in the day. But in all my adventures with computers, I have never found a single one whose BIOS setup utility, at the very least, would not accept a 2012 date. A post-2000 date, sorry. The only machine that I have ever seen fail to do that was a Packard Bell 386SX. And for those of you in the crowd who know what Packard Bell stood for when they were still in the U.S. market and still an independent company, I think you can understand completely why that would be the case. There are some special setup options in here, of course, for interesting hardware that didn't stand the test of time. For example, take this entry, entry for a Waytech processor. The Waytech processor was actually a math coprocessor on steroids, if not a processor that could completely stand on its own in other applications. However, it never enjoyed much popularity in the PC world, and eventually this option faded away from the PC-compatible motherboard and BIOS. Let's go ahead and see if it'll boot, folks. Didn't detect the hard drive. Well, we'll have to go back and fix that. It has a one megabyte video adapter in it, interestingly enough. It's kind of overkill for a 386. Let's see here. Oh, where do we go to change that? It's been a while since I've been in one of these. Okay, here we go. Hard disk C type. I suppose it's going to make me define the type of disk that it is, which ought to be good for a laugh or two. Anybody else remember doing this? I'm sure there's a couple people here that are watching and can remember typing in these parameters. In case you ever wondered what all those numbers printed on the hard drive were, you had to enter those into the system setup program. It wasn't like you can do today and just have the drive automatically detected and configured appropriately. And there we go. Once again, I'm a little surprised at the card of hardware that's in this machine because if that disk geometry calculation is correct, and I believe that it is, this thing has a 520 megabyte hard drive in it, which is probably the biggest that this system would natively support without any third-party assistance, such as an add-on controller card or disk overlay software like uh, OnTrack or Microhouse's old EZ drive. Let's see if it'll boot now. I don't even remember what all this thing's running. Oh, we got a DOS prompt. Let's see what version of DOS we're actually running. Version 6.22. Now, since this thing is misdetecting the monitor type and thinks it's got a monochrome monitor attached, I'll go ahead and uh, run the Microsoft Diagnostics program. That's really about the only interesting thing I can run because the hard drive in this machine was apparently wiped and the only thing that was reloaded was a copy of MS-DOS. There's no copy of Windows on there, no games, no anything like that. So hopefully in the coming months or something like that, I can go ahead and uh, get this thing up on its feet with a meaningful operating system installation. You could probably run Windows 95 pretty well on a 386DX40, but I'm not about to try it with only 4 megabytes of memory in place. And unfortunately, my 30-pin SIM collection is uh, pretty far and few between. So there's some information about the system itself information about the uh, extended and conventional memory. There's no expanded memory in this system. The video card, you can see right there how it's misdetecting the display type, so even if I hadn't forced Microsoft Diagnostics to run in monochrome mode, it would have run in the color mode and it would have looked completely incorrect. Everything is being mapped down to shades of gray at the moment. No mouse, no other adapters, some disk drives. Yeah, there's not a whole lot on that hard drive at the moment. 
one printer port, two serial ports, although I don't know that those actually exist. No copy of Windows. Let's see, interrupt request. There's a couple of things in this machine as far as expansion cards go, but this predates the era of plug and play, so you had to know all these resources and interrupt some things to set your adapters up so that they wouldn't step on one another. You can see, compared to my microchannel systems, how much of a step forward the implied plug and play concept of microchannel really was. You know, these days we take plug and play for granted and it even mostly works. It didn't exist when this system was made. You actually had to know how to configure all your hardware and get everything going just the way that you wanted to. Well, that's about everything there is to demonstrate on this system, so until I do something else with it, thank you for watching, and feel free to leave a comment if you have one.